No wonder Jesus got himself in trouble. He was forever tweaking the authorities. He would pose these little conundra for the authorities to, uh, to chew on. If the Son of Man, the Son of David, is the Christ, and if the Christ is the Son of David, how is it that David calls him my Lord? There's a logical inconsistency here at the very least. And like any good classroom full of students, those who sat there and listened to him loved it when he tweaked the teachers, when he would uh, pose these things for them that they couldn't answer. I taught high school all my life. I know what it's like when someone stands up in a classroom and gets the teacher on a hook and lets them, watches them squirm a little bit. People enjoy that. But it got Jesus in a lot of trouble because he was challenging the authority of the teachers. He was challenging the authority of those who stood before the community as those with authority. Because his authority, of course, was greater. And his authority was beyond challenge. And when he spoke, he spoke not only with wisdom, but he spoke with truth. And sometimes the truth made people uncomfortable. Sometimes the truth left them a little bit uneasy. But what Jesus was challenging was not their right to teach. He wasn't challenging their authority. He was challenging the basis on which they established their authority. He was challenging their loss of perspective on what their authority actually meant and what the substance of the teaching was. Not the, just the words, but the actual substance. And what it points to, and what something that I have perhaps spoken about before, is the difference between faith and religiosity. It's the difference between our relationship with God as the very core of our faith and the external practice of that faith, the external practice of religion that comes from that faith. And when that external practice becomes more important than the faith, perspective is lost, balance is disrupted. Faith and religious practice have to mutually inform each other because religious practice without faith is empty ritual. And faith that doesn't express itself in practice is pure theory. For Jesus, it was always a question of the balance between those two. And the more important part of it is the faith, because that's where the essence of our religious tradition finds itself. It's in the relationship with God that brings us into an intimacy with God, a personal connection with God that informs our practice, that gives meaning and energy to our practice. So that we practice religion not for its sake, we practice religion for the sake of being faithful to the relationship that we have with the God who has called us into life, who has loved us into being, who has saved us in love, and who invites us into holiness. It's that faith relationship at the very center and core of our religious tradition that gives value and meaning to all the rest of it. And without that relationship, the rest of it loses its value. And this is what Jesus was running into constantly in Israel as he dealt with people. They had lost the sense of that relationship. They had lost the sense of that connectedness with God at the core of their spirit that gave meaning to the law and gave meaning to the tradition. And so the law became an end in itself, and it was never meant to be that. And so following the law became an end in itself, and it was certainly never meant to be that. And so Jesus would constantly remind them of that would remind them of the need to be faithful to the God who was faithful to them. But that first, that faithfulness depended on that deep relationship with God that expressed itself in a faithful following of the law. Now, the fact that he stood up and with authority spoke to the people and challenged the interpretation of the faith that the religious leaders of his day had meant he got himself in trouble. And so he was persecuted. In fact, he was crucified. And similarly, those who stood for the truth of God's presence in our world through the incarnate word of God in Jesus Christ expected to be persecuted. Paul faced persecutions of any number of descriptions and speaks about it very eloquently in a number of places in his letters. 
It reminds me of that somewhat silly statement, but nevertheless true. If you wish to follow Christ, you better look good on a cross because those who follow Christ will be persecuted. We see it in our world all the time. We see in the world that those who in fact stand up for the gospel are persecuted. Modern day martyrs, people who proclaim the justice of the gospel, who work for the poor, who stand up for the rights of those who are, who are downtrodden, who stand up for the rights of those who are pushed to the margins of society, who call for justice for the poor, they're persecuted because their message confronts the powers around them. And as you may realize, people who have power don't like to be confronted. And so they react, and often violently. In our world, though, there is an absolute need for that kind of courage and truth to stand up and speak about the gospel in the face of injustice, in the face of unbelief, in the face of all of the materialism and the secularism that has become commonplace in our culture. There is a need to speak the truth about God, even when people don't want to hear it, even when it is unpopular. And there's a need to call for this kind of integrity in our world when values are put aside, at least the values of the gospel are put aside in favor of political correctness or expediency or just getting on, getting by. So the challenge remains the same. The challenge remains the same as the challenge that Jesus faced. The challenge to remind people that the, what's important in life is the depth of our relationship with God that leads then to work for the values that God calls forth in us, to stand up for the values of Christ, God's word made present in our world, to stand up for the values of the gospel that speak about care for the poor, that speak about the rights of those who are left to the margins, and that call for justice for those people that they should be treated with the dignity that they deserve as being created in God's own image. Because that's what gospel justice is about, treating people with the dignity they deserve as created in God's own image. If you stand for that, you better look good on a cross. And so let us offer our prayers to our God that we might have the courage to speak the truth of the gospel, to speak, up the, to speak about the values of Jesus Christ, to live those values in our own life, that God's word might be made manifest to the world, we pray to the Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all those who suffer injustice, that they might find God's consoling love to sustain them and support them, we pray to the Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the sick, for all in our family who are ill or who are suffering in any way, that they may be consoled by God's presence, we pray to the Lord. Amen. We pray for the deceased, that they may be welcomed into God's holy embrace in the resurrection, we pray to the Lord. Amen. And we pray for our own personal needs. For all of these, we pray to the Lord. Amen. Father of all goodness, we ask that you hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and grant us these things because we pray to you in faith. And in the name of Jesus, amen.